Let's talk first, Hal, about the upcoming Metrograph retrospective because obviously that's imminent, and um, right, uh, and, and you know, it's the the main thing is to get people to come out to see the films and and to see you because you are going to be making a couple of appearances. Yeah, a couple, two. Yeah, this Friday, the twenty fourth, and then Saturday, the following Saturday, which I think is the second of February. Mm. So they're showing on Friday, January 24th, which is this Friday, they're showing The Unbelievable Truth at 6.30. So you're going to be there for that Q&A? Right. Or, uh, so that ought to finish up at about 8.15. So, yeah, I'll do a Q&A after um, The Unbelievable Truth and then introduce Simple Men right after that, the 9 o'clock screening. And then hightail it out of there. <laughs> yeah, well, we're probably going to, like, uh, hold court up in the restaurant. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. So if you're out there and you're a fan of Hal Hartley, and, and for God's sakes, how wouldn't you be? Come on out to the Metrograph uh, this, this Friday. But if you can't make it Friday, Saturday things continue with uh, a screening in the afternoon at one thirty of Trust. Then no such thing. It's almost as if they're showing all your feature films. They are. They're showing all the feature films. <laughs> Okay, so that continues on through the weekend. Check the Metrograph website for obviously details, but there, but it's all it's all there. And then the following weekend, it picks up on Friday of next week. No, excuse me, incorrect. Saturday of next week, there is no screening on Friday in this retrospective. Picks up Saturday afternoon at four o'clock with Henry Fool and Faye Grimm, Ned Rifle, and you're going to be there. I'm going to guess after the Faye Grimm screening. I think so. Yeah. I, I'll do a Q&A, and then I'll introduce the final film, Ned Rifle. Well, it looks like Ned Rifle's on Sunday, though. Oh, yeah? Is so, that, I see. Yeah. Unless you're getting there at Henry Fool's at 4 o'clock, so maybe you get there for the Q&A for that one, and then it's a little, it's a little early, as I was thinking. And then yeah, that's right. Fake it must Rim. be between. If, that's, if those are the only two films that they're showing that day, that's... Right. Would it really kill you, though, to spend a few more hours there? I mean, my God, what have <laughs> you got to do? Hmm. <laughs> I would have been. It would have been interesting if uh, somebody had yeah. programmed all three films of the trilogy in one day. But that would be. I know. Kind uh, of a cool why, thing. I, it's curious why they didn't do that, but yeah. I'm sure they they had their reasons. Yeah. By the way, these are not typical indie f- length films. Your films are generally about two hours. I mean, there's some exceptions that rifles are about 85 minutes, but... Uh, yeah, but Henry, Henry Fool was long. It's 136 minutes, yeah. Yeah, that's a, nice, that's a nice Hollywood length, if you will. Yeah, it's coming back. Long films are coming back in style. I'd like to think so. Isn't that essentially something that theaters have been requiring or commanding, in a sense, and that, or festivals have? Like, you know, a festival wants a nice 80-minute, 85-minute film so they can squeeze in tons of films? Well, I, I don't know. I was told that um, at the beginning of the, the history of cinema, you know, it kind of took a night at the theater as a, as a rule of thumb. You know, that was you know, some night, an hour and a half, two-hour entertainment was, you know, what movie ought to be and but uh, right at the very beginning people started making really long films like D.W. Griffith and sure you know all that I mean we're talking about like nine hour long films it was like a, bit, a whole day but those guys Claude Landsman almost... didn't invent that in other words right yeah also if you think about it 85 if, if, if you're at a fe- there should be a festival length but I'm thinking if, you know yeah you have... they, they do festivals and um, yeah theaters have, have always yeah, it's changed as the years went on. But I remember, like, five, six years ago, the joke on the street was that 85 is the new 90, you know. <laughs> well, you know, with with independent films, it, it I especially at f- festivals, I kind of see it because you are doing Q&As after all of the screenings. Right. Um, so it really does pack on a lot of time if you're trying to show a certain number of films. Uh, I could see it. And and also independent films at theaters, especially on the weekends, you are also getting often the filmmakers coming opening weekends and things like right. that. But other, I don't know. But getting back to your retrospective, as we already said, your sh- sh- th- Metrograph, it, which is located on uh, 7 Ludlow Street, uh, just north of Canal. Which which film? I know you, that you went back on a couple of your 
a, a bunch of your films. You did two box sets in the last couple of years where you, I, I say remastered, but you right, you kind of updated, you scanned and updated some of your films. Um, yeah, for, I mean, uh, some of them, some of them hadn't been in. Uh, Rendered in high definition, yeah. So, oh, we so did it's all high that. definition, and plus yeah. the subtitles, and the subtitles, and you know, put them on Blu-ray, and you know, yeah, it's uh, we've done real restoration work on those um, things like Trust and Simple Men. You know, have never looked as good. You know, just sometimes it's just cleaning them up, you know, getting rid of dust and stuff like that that you know was impossible to avoid back in the day. We never mm. even saw that stuff, but now that everyone's used to watching high definition images on on these beautiful flat screen TVs, it's, you know yeah. you see a lot of stuff that you never would have seen when it was projected. So you know it's a lot of cleaning. Um, sometimes I go in, I can improve on some uh, audio things. Right. Uh, yeah. You have all these beautiful new prints, but then, of course, a metrograph like Filmform and a bunch of other art houses insist on showing 35 millimeter. So all that hard work is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. they don't appreciate it. And you, they go well, back. I, they want. Know, I don't really have a problem with it. I mean, I'm happy that people know. want to see it. And, you know, they're fond of it. But you know, the people out at the Chicago Film Institute, Julian Antos and his people, they wanted prints of, of trust, and and so. Julian kind of organized this effort, uh, a collaboration of various other film societies around the country, and they, you know, they, you know, it was going to cost them fifteen thousand dollars to do, and they somehow raised that money. And so I said, "Well, if you raise the money, you can have this, the uh, the negative, and you strike a new print." So they did. So they were, you know, and then the print stays with the. The Film Institute of they Chicago. They lease it. They're leasing it in a sense, or right. You, so or, right. So the Metrograph talks to them, and they they rent uh, oh, know, access to the print. Yeah. Right. So, but you own it. The the film. It's just that I own the film, but they own that print. That print <laughs> makes yeah. It's compli- a little complicated, but yeah. so what do you make of that? It's like did they, so when they printed when they rendered a print, did they also they didn't do any r- restoration on it? They just rendered a print, right? Yeah, they probably you, you, what you generally you, you take the cut negative and you put it through a sonic cleanser, you know, this kind of yeah. oh, okay. thing that clean gets as much dust and stuff off of it as possible, and then they yeah they went through the the print making process and struck a new print. Is there like a finite number of times you can do that to a, a negative? Um, yeah, I mean you can't do it indefinitely. You make something called an internegative, and then an, uh, an interpositive, and then an internegative, and it's really the internegative that you use to strike prints with. You, you try not to go back to the actual cut negative until you absolutely have to. I, mean, I can imagine really popular films. Uh, you know, that played in movie theaters for over a year. And they probably had to go back two or three times to the actual cut negative and make another interpositive uh, just because the interpositives get worn out as well. well who's that guy, Julian, at the, in Chicago? What's, what, yeah, what's his Julian Antos. position? Antos? Antos, yes. He's the, he's the curator? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I think he's the, that's what you call him, the chief curator. Okay. Well, that's good. So you, it still works out. As a print, I think they actually are showing Henry Fool a, a print of Henry Fool, which they uh-huh. got probably from Sony Pictures Classics, I guess. Um, I yeah, I really don't know. I really, Faye Grimm was shot in HD, and then it, right. it was required then at the time that you had to have a film print. So we made a film print. Of it, but you know, I never liked it. I mean, I'd I prefer see. people will see it in HD. Um, well, I can say, I'm sorry, Hal, go ahead. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it is HD. So I don't know what to, they'll do. You got well, to respect their, I do respect their, what, you know, what they want. Their aesthetic, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can see actually, uh, not to belabor, I am belaboring, so it's too late, but uh, the unbelievable truth, simple men trust, no such thing, amateur flirt. Henry Fool, Faye Grimm, all of those titles are going to be shown on 35 millimeter. Wow. The rest will be shown on DCP. 
Right. There you go. That's the. That's uh, how. That's how it is. It's, it's right here in the on the website. <laughs> Say could have saved a lot of time, Hal. Sorry <laughs> about that. I've already wasted a significant amount. So we 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 met up in your your new offices. You, you Possible Films has now um, its own location across the hall from your your home. Right. Yeah. And we were talking about probably trying to set up a a, a, a small theater in there. I think you could do it. <laughs> so, it would be. It would be a digital theater, though. It would. Yeah. But you're spending all this time. You could do some. I think you should do that if you are. If you do, in fact, return to uh, uh, re- restoring and, and updating. Updating, we'll say, because of the subtitles, etc. That you should uh, do some. You could do some screen, uh, like you know, friends and family screenings. Yeah, it might be. It might be fun. At the right uh, there, you just put in some good sounds, some good sound uh, opportunity there. And, and when I say friends and family, I mean me. Yes, and Chris. It's okay. I'd like to see something. Now, the other thing that we we have to talk about is we just talked about this retrospective, but it's actually in a way uh, that's January twenty fourth through the February second. By the way, just to reiterate, but this is almost like it's leading up to in the spring you're to be shooting a new film. Yeah, and April twenty we'll start shooting uh, the new film Where to Land. And it's true. We started talking to uh, the Metrograph in early 2019, and the idea was to have the retrospective lead up to the beginning of the new Kickstarter, uh, which I knew would start in December, mid-December. Um, and then one thing led to another, and it just couldn't happen. So it happened after the Kickstarter. Um, well... I, that, yeah, I understand that w- would have made a practical sense. Then you had all those opportunities to mention it to all yeah. these people that have just bought tickets, right? And that obviously were invested in you and in your films. And then, yeah, but you know, it all worked out well. It all worked out well. I, now it I really think did. the the retrospective down at the Metrograph is really uh, benefiting from the media blitz that we perpetrated during December. <laughs> Oh, right. So yeah. they're benefiting from doing it after. Yeah, so I, I hope it helps them. I hope, I, hope, I hope they do well with the ticket sales. Oh, I think so. I think they will. Yeah. I was actually uh, just happened to be, I was, but I was, I was out of town yesterday, and I went to talk to an actor who I've, I've known for many years. He's in, and he has a substantial role in uh, The Irishman, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah, his name is uh, Louis Cancelmi. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know him, but he's a great actor, and um, he. Um, we were talking about like movies that he, you know, he grew up in Alaska and then in Seattle, and I was just saying, you know, it came to the point where we're at. I was asking about, you know, when did you first become, you know, enamored, if ever, with watching movies, and um, and he rattled off a number of films, and he mentioned you. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. So, Everybody has an effect sometime, <laughs> at some point. No, yeah, uh, and I've shared with you that as a young guy, when I was in the in the uh, '80s, uh, when I was t- separating my own tastes, discovering my own films, you know, that right. I it was right as you were coming, you know, you were making your films, and so I discovered you, and so I think um, there is definitely a bunch of us currently in our. 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever, that uh, certainly are already familiar with you. And what's nice is I think this also, you know, gives uh, you an opportunity to be introduced to a new audience, obviously. Yeah, I mean, that's what I hope the for hope, most right? is, you know, ultimately that the uh, the enthusiasm of the people who know the films are coming out, uh, you know, kind of spreads out and, you know, we reach uh, a wider and, and newer audience a younger audience you know just for the you know life for the films to have another life well this is how many kickstarters we should say that you just recently it was as of um last week yeah december 4th we finished oh it was the fourth already so excuse me so it's been more like two weeks okay yeah so you 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 set as your goal three hundred thousand, and you made i was going to say uh upwards of 20 percent more than that you yeah, surpassed. yeah, we did. It was in the, l- the last twenty-four hours of the Kickstarter. A lot of people signed on, and 
it was pretty exciting. And you, th- this was just slightly smaller than your fake rim. Uh, um, no, that was the Ned Rifle Kickstarter that we did in oh, 2013. Oh, excuse me, the Ned Rifle one. That's what I meant to say, Ned Rifle. So, and that was your first one? That was the second one. The first one was for Meanwhile. Uh, we had already completed the film Meanwhile, but I wanted to self-distribute it on DVD and sell it from our website. And um, so we needed $40,000 to uh, manufacture those. And uh, yeah, we raised there. We raised like sixty, you know. Mm-hmm. So oh wow! Was, so, mm-hmm. and I, that's when I really began uh, paying attention closely to the fact that these Kickstarter backers are probably my core audience. You know, these are the kind of people who, you know, they'll put down twenty five dollars, fifty dollars for a product a year before they're going to get it. You know, so. I had to start thinking of them as really the core audience. And um, and then two years after that, we did the Ned Rifle Kickstarter. And, you know, that was considerably more. That was, we went out for 300 and, I don't know, like 360 or something. And we got mm-hmm. 390. And um, that was very difficult to do. But we did, again fortify that core audience we just kind of isolated them we knew who they were they were a lot of the same people who had signed on for the meanwhile kickstarter also came back mm-hmm. and from that point on i have always you know it's this regular part of our work here week after week is to you know keep that audience in mind um because they'll come back for another kickstarter um, right and so, you know, we treat them well and, you know, we, everything, you know, from having a newsletter and, f- you know, fine, you know, f- polishing up the kick, the uh, website and all that. You know, so it, at this point, it's a real sustain- sustainable business model. And, uh, yeah, and that's remarkable. all based on those backers. Yeah. 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 It's almost worth, it's not quite there, but it's almost worth doing the Kickstarter for the sake of just creating a momentum with the, that core audience, as you're saying, which it keeps expanding, uh, fortunately. But it's it, it, the money is obviously the key, but it's sometime, in some ways rallying and, and creating momentum with that audience is in of itself is really important. That way, really when you does, do get, that way when you do get to that next project or, or what, when you need their attention, you, you, you know, you don't have to start from zero. Yeah. No, it was interesting to see how uh, sales at HalHartley.com spiked during the 30-day Kickstarter campaign. You know, people who would put in a little bit of money towards the new film uh, would then go to HalHartley.com and purchase books or, the, you know, DVD box sets or whatever music um it was quite good and in particular i was uh gratified to see that in europe it spiked a lot more this mm-hmm. time it's been, it's been hard to kind of crack the european um customers and get them you know to shop online and yeah that. that's always and been an issue right the, yeah the, this, this americans seem far more amenable to that yeah americans and japanese people are uh really kind of easy with the internet shopping on the internet and we should mention ja- the J- japanese audience is one of the segments that you're yeah we, we you use subtitle are. everything and uh in japanese french german and spanish as well as in english for the hearing mm-hmm. impaired and 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 our foreign friends who can understand english but they pref- they like to see it you know, i have like a Palestinian friend who you know can understand English fine, but he likes to read it too when he's watching a film. Yeah, it reinforces, of course, that makes yeah. sense. Now, when you're talking about the hearing impaired, so you're also adding. In other words, is this a separate option where you also their sound sounds are described? No, Music is described, no, we don't. Kind of, no, okay. we don't do that. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think the. Uh, Subtitling is helpful. Sufficient. Yeah. 
no doubt. So you raise the money. Was the, do you feel like you're at a point where you know that if you, you know your threshold, I suppose, and you know that if you, you guys, if you follow these steps, and if you know you're you keep on a schedule, like you project manage yourself correctly, you will make your goals. They're almost almost. You can feel well, pretty confident not- that the. Or is it still each time you're still, you know, sweating it out? Yeah, you sweat it out. Uh, because you can do a lot of things that you know work, meaning that you will definitely get into people's faces, you know, and you'll stay in their consciousness and so that for a matter of time. But, you know, economy changes and, you know, Sometimes people just don't have the money to spare, you know, spare. Sure. That's true. I had so, I hadn't considered that. That's true. There are um, external factors that have nothing to do with with what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the Kickstarter people told me that too. I mean, that's all they do all day long. They're a demographics think tank, you know. And so and uh they were concerned that three hundred thousand might be like too much to go out for at this point. And um I said, yeah, but it is what I need. And uh, they said, yeah, we're just expressing our concern. That's what we are. Because a very small amount, a very small percentage of film-based projects on Kickstarter get that high. You know, they very rarely break like $100,000. So, you mean in the film the film world? Or are you talking yeah. about overall? Because overall, no, it's much, much, much bigger. As you said, the pro- film projects on Kickstarter tend to not raise more than 100,000. I see. And and they said and they did say that, you know, crowdsourcing is kind of seen you know like 4 or 5 years ago it was a more popular thing and they felt that uh, you know it's they can sense that it's right now it's not uh, such a popular thing. And then, you know so that could be a reflection of the overall economy. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. sure that there's uh, waves like anything else, um, right. ebbs and flows, etc. There is one category of films that seem not to suffer, uh, <laughs> can raise enormous amounts of money, and they're not documentaries, <laughs> right? Oh. <laughs> Faith-based uh, films. Faith-based. That's correct. Yes. Um, <laughs> this was the, the largest thing. I remember this back in 2013 when we were preparing for the Ned Rifle. Kickstarter, um, I noticed then that it was faith-based, you know, Christian movies um, were the ones that could get sometimes as much as five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and um, because I mean, a faith, a religion is the original, um, original social media. <laughs> yes, the original. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Is uh, it's a crowd, right? So community, sure. So, um, so you got a built-in community right there. You're revolt- You're 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 avoiding the word cult. A cult. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, cult. The word cult can be used in different ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Catholic Church calls Protestant churches cults. A lot of the time, um, but even when I was a kid, I mean, we listened to rock and roll. That was, you know, they said that they have a cult following. Yeah, I remember, like even Genesis was called a, you know, you know even even what the band Genesis in the seventies were often referred to as that they had a cult following. Uh, I wonder. I guess also, I'm just gonna. I'm just assuming Kickstarter doesn't make any any profit if your project fails. I'm guessing that's right. right. So, they don't. Um, so um, yeah. they take us. They take a piece off of the successful campaigns. That's how they make their their money. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, they're very invested in you succeeding. Um, right. So they they bring your their expertise to the to the game. And, you know, talk you through things and ask you questions and, uh, you know, give you advice. They also have uh, um, a social media outreach of their own and Mm -hmm. more conventional uh, PR tools. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, I would imagine by now having done, you said five or six, I forget how many campaigns have you done? Uh, This last one was the sixth. 
was the sixth one. That's so right. I can imagine you would be able to speak rather articulately about, or, you know, give a lot of good advice anyway about... Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, at least for... It might be different for different kinds of projects. Um, you know, like if you were... I don't know what I would say to someone who just has a one-off thing. Like, you know, you, you haven't made films before. Uh, you're not a writer or something, and suddenly you want to raise money to make a book or your mm -hmm. first film. I mean, it's hard to know what to tell people there. I mean, the success well, I've had has been very much because I knew there was a worldwide fan base for my film. So it was really mm -hmm. just a... The first step was to get back in touch with all those people and let them know that it was doing something. And then we built on that. And I think we've acquired more fans uh, from outside that zone. But uh, we had to start there. Right. And well, well maybe at the very least, you could, uh, one piece of advice might be potentially that even if this is a one off, as you put it, Think about that, that this is not a one-off, maybe, even if you don't have any plans for some follow-up project. But think about it in the, in the hypothetical. That way you, are, you approach it as if you're building a community of people around what you're doing. Yeah. And that it's something you may indeed need to tap into in the future and kind of approach it that way as opposed to, eh, once it's over, I got my money, you know, delete, 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 <laughs> you know. Exactly, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was organized to think that way from the very beginning because, I mean, filmmaking had always been that way. I mean, even, you know, when we finance films in a more traditional way, we'd raise the money, we'd make the film. But then, you know, I'd spend the better part of a year on the road promoting that film. And in no uncertain terms, just letting fans out there, the audience members out there know that, you know, I'm going to be making more films too, and um, you're know, just trying to... I mean, it was all different before the internet. Once, you know, we got the capacity to have emails and you know, newsletters and stuff like that, uh, mm -hmm. it, it made everything a lot different, and you didn't need as many intermediaries. At this point, I really don't see the point of a distributor, for instance, or a sales agent. Um, you know, we I can think do it's, all ourselves. You know, the only thing I could say, in your, you have the added benefit of that you had a following that you had in your pocket when you started it. It may not be... Exactly, yeah. That's it right. may not have been the most internet savvy going into the beginning or what have you, and a lot of people have come around since, but but there is a certain at least you know baseline or whatever you want to call it uh, that you came in with. So similarly, when, like like uh, or on the other end of the spectrum, when I started like this podcast just a, as a mm -hmm. you know I didn't think about like oh I'm going to try to get this huge audience. I kind of fell into it for a different reason, but. One thing I found frustrating, you know, is that a lot of people who start podcasts have a, you know, maybe a comedian, right. you know, or some celebrity, and they have these this enormous already community of people that, that are following them. So they start with this, you know, number. Whereas if you're like me, I, I kind of started this thing with, you know, no, no, no following. So I had to build it from nothing, you know. Right, yeah. Um, and so it's, it's a different, you know, it's something to, to think about when you're doing these types of... Uh, you know, yeah, no, I have well. a lot of uh, friends. A few of them are starting different kinds of podcasts and stuff. I have a friend, yeah. Rory, who's doing this kind of, he's a historian and he kind of, uh, and an actor. So uh, they do these reenactments of famous crimes from the, oh, nice. from the 19th century. That's uh, great. And then you have Bukok, who uh, I remember. Yeah, yeah, Paul's trying to, you know, get his back up he took a hiatus there but he's mm -hmm. uh he's recording more stuff now well scripting is a lot more work uh, i have to say yeah i mean i don't know how people do it i thought about it i i have one i have a great idea for a scripted podcast but i mean you know it's um the it's it's a bit you know just a daunting let's put it that way yeah i mean it's a production that's the point but yeah. there are you can kind of approach it more like a s episodic TV yeah. in the sense of that there are seasons and so you it's perfectly makes perfect sense to take breaks to prepare for the right. next season yes as opposed to what I'm doing which yeah. I I can't 
stop. <laughs> I feel anyway. <laughs> so I need you to keep coming back on. <laughs> uh, thank you for doing that. So we mentioned this new film. Uh, you said on April twentieth they're going to begin production. The um, well, we begin is shooting get... on uh, yep. April twenty. We're yep. already hard at work on it every day now. Yes. So I'm going to start setting it up, and like I did the other day, <laughs> you can interrupt me just to do a better job or to correct me. But uh, it's called, again, it's, you mentioned it's called Where to Land, and it's about a middle-aged, it's fair to say middle-aged filmmaker, rock director? Oh, uh, 58. Oh, rom-coms? What's that? What's that now? Is that middle-aged or what? Middle-aged, I guess, is anywhere from late 30s to dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on who you're talking to. Well, he's a 58-year-old guy. Okay. A man, a director of rom of romantic comedies, a successful uh, director of romantic comedies who is uh, reaching, I guess, a point where he wants a f- to try something new in his life. He's maybe feeling a little, I don't know, uh, in a rut of some sort, perhaps. Is that is that strong or is that? Yeah, he's he feeling, to- yeah, he, he feels some kind of spiritual need, <laughs> you know, to reach out some and malaise. do something different. <laughs> And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, he, um, but it is true that at the beginning of the film, he walks into a graveyard in his neighborhood and, you know, which has a lot of trees and stuff. And he applies for a job as an assistant groundskeeper at this cemetery. And the main groundskeeper tells him that he must be having a midlife crisis. So maybe that's all it really is. You know, you get to a place in your life, you've had some success, Things are cool, but, uh, you know, you're curious about doing new things. It's, yeah, and uh, also you may be, because, you know, you're successful in what you're doing, and this may be the character who Bill Sage is our man that we're talking about, the director, perhaps, and his name is Joe Fulton, if I'm not mistaken. That's Joe right, Fulton. Joe Fulton. Yeah. Um, he's, you know, w- when you're at a certain success, you don't have the time to do other things that you really wanted, always wanted to do, and maybe felt kind of gra- that you always wanted to do more, like you know maybe it's out being outdoors, working with your hands more, or whatever it is, uh-huh. and it's something you kind of ignored, and then you know you're realizing my life is is you know moving at this clip, and I I'll never have the opportunity to you know do that. Um, so it's you know it sounds kind of crazy that the successful director is going to work in a cemetery, yeah. um, but it's. I think he just lived right by there, and there was a sign, and he was just in it. But I remember some years, some years ago, when I maybe like even before I made Ned Rifle, I, I remember walking by that cemetery because it's on the the way to the restaurant where I generally eat supper, and you know I saw this older guy, you know, working, cleaning mm-hmm. up twigs, and you know. <laughs> and uh, I just felt so like I said, "Wow, that's lovely! What a great job!" Right. It's uncomplicated. Yeah. At the end unfettered. of the day, he just goes home and right. It's done, <laughs> and he goes back to work tomorrow. And you know, I've never had that kind of thing since the time I was a teenager. I've always been obsessed with you know making something, even before it was motion pictures. But. Um, yeah, I never turn off. I never go home, in a sense, in my head. So, uh, yeah, so that so the idea has been in my head for a while. Hmm, I see. So Joe is an extension of yourself. But I guess Freud I would think argue so. that I mean, all your characters are. Yeah, it's not autobiographical, <laughs> but I think it is personal. This is maybe more uh, right. personal than any of the others. You know, um, to just what I'm thinking about right now, but, uh, and yeah, you know, so I decided not sorry. to invent a character too different than my own circumstances. This, this is character is a, a guy about my age who's had a certain measure of success, and you know, you know, lives as I live and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I didn't feel the need to invent anything like that, and mm-hmm. you know, I tried to craft dialogue that shows the kind of conversations that are I'm likely to have with my friends and family and uh, he, he around the around the same period uh, he also decides he's going um, to write his will 
That's right. He goes to the lawyer to get his will made, which is something I had to do last year. And, oh, uh, that you had to do. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was just really intrigued by it. The whole thing, you know, you have to go home and make a list of everything you own and decide who you're going to give it to when you pass on. on. <laughs> it's funny. well. Who's yeah. going to want all my books? Nobody's. Going I to would. Want my books. I, yeah. I, love, I love. Well, I have a feeling I won't be around that much. <laughs> I'm in this room. I don't know if they're going to be useful by the time this happens. So, but I do love the books. Well, we could discuss that at a later time, okay? Yeah. Just yeah. before you write that part of your will, just <laughs> consider me, you know. But if I let's say if we're to take Joe Fulton's circumstances in a in a realistic way, let's say we know somebody like you're describing yourself who did take a job in a cemetery where I understand uh there are dead people buried there. So, and then at the same time, you are writing up your will. If I was in Joe's life, if I was a good friend of his, I might be alarmed. That's exactly what happens. Yes, his, what? his very excitable girlfriend gets uh-huh. uh, puts these things together and just imagines that he must be dying and that he's just too brave to tell anybody. That's and right. uh, so then a rumor starts and his niece and his neighbors and mm-hmm. his his uh, associates everybody starts showing up at his apartment desperate to you know to see what the problem is yeah. and so he spends his whole day correcting everybody's assumptions so is this a comedy yes <laughs> okay <laughs> it's what we call a comedy of errors a com- right, that's true. It could yeah. be a comedy of errors. Wait, is so Bill Sage is he is he is he dressed up as a woman through most of this and <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> fooling everybody? <laughs> like you know, no, not, no. Not it so. takes place in one day, and yeah, he goes. Oh, okay. goes to the cemetery, and then he goes to the lawyer's office, and by the time he comes back from the lawyer's office, his girlfriend and his niece have concocted this terrifying story that Joe is. On you know, dying, <laughs> everyone starts coming over to the apartment, and then it ends with a big party. They all oh, that's always nice. Yeah, a celebration. Yeah. Um, it's a farce. Life. It's very much a farce. Sounds like it. Yeah, sounds like it could have been a play, and you have written your share. Well, I read all of my uh, all the Moliere I have here in the, the ah, library right. before, but I do that when I run Tartuffe. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or two mm-hmm. f- school for wives, the miser, of course, most famously. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, you also have Robert Burke, John Burke, Robert John Burke plays the uh, groundskeeper. That's right. Okay, and uh, Tatiana Abrakos. Uh, Abreso, Tatiana Abrasos plays the Abrasos. Ex- yeah, she okay. plays the uh, excitable girlfriend, and then it's Parker Posey plays oh. Joe's lawyer, mm. and Edie Falco plays Joe's. Oh Ex wife, Clara. So, wow. And uh, they did once have a relationship, right? Way back in the day, right? I, yeah, I do think Bill and Edie were a couple mm. when they were in college or something. If you, uh, yeah, well, it came up on the podcast. I hope that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they've been real close their whole adult lives. Uh, who else is we got? This guy named DJ John. Mendel. DJ Mendel, right, is playing Mendel, excuse me. Oliver. Mm-hmm. Oliver. He, Oliver is the uh, building superintendent, um, who's a, also an anarchist, and is running for city council. <laughs> um, <laughs> this man named John Plummis, who, uh, very good actor, who actually lives in my building. Um, he is playing a neighbor named Tom, who is religious, and uh, is always trying to talk Joe into. Uh, Making his peace with God before he passes away. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wait, is that? I have to ask. Is this a neighbor? Uh, you said it's an actor. Is yeah, there a na- but he's but so he this but you don't have another neighbor that is. Yeah, no, it's just a coincidence. This this actor happens to live in my my building, I see. and okay, uh, I, I've seen him act, and I like his work and everything like that. And, you know, we mm-hmm. often talk. We meet each other on the subway and stuff like that. Uh, so I, you know, I just always wanted to kind of work with him, and uh, I think this is—he'll do a good job with this role. 
it's like, you know, Joe's got different kinds of friends. He has a friend named Eric, who's a, a rock guitarist who's his age, in his late 50s. And, and but he's very uh, cynical and skeptical. Mm-hmm. Where on the other side, Joe's neighbor, Tom, is this has not got an ironic bone in his body. You know, he's like the most kind and <laughs> considerate uh, kind of person. And he happens to be religious. So uh, there are some pretty funny conversations about the afterlife in Joe's kitchen between the aging rock guitarist and this gentle Christian from across the hall. So what's the what is the production timeline? Do you you you're starting? You said April twentieth. Uh, is it like a three week kind of thing, or do you think uh, it's more like two, thirteen two days at this point? Okay, uh, thirteen days. Yeah, early May we'll be done shooting. Nice, and because um, you're mostly shooting in your neighborhood in your apartment in local uh, venues. We're, local. We're trying to stay as local as possible. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So no uh, spontaneous trips to Chile plan? No. <laughs> okay. No, no. Uh, and so are, what's your plan? Are you going to, I mean, I, if, I, I know distribution is always the hot button topic when it comes to these things. But since you've done and tried so many various ways of getting the films out in the world, I just wonder if you've already been thinking about that step already. Well, um, yeah, I think about it, but I don't, not too much. Um, th- you know, distribution of movies like this is, a thing in the past. I mean, people right. don't go out to the theaters to see uh, films like these uh, much anymore. Uh, they do at retro houses like the Metrograph and stuff like that, and they do yeah. in film societies. So that kind of distribution um, we can do ourselves. So we we basically this office here operates as a booking office, and mm-hmm. generally, you know, there's. You know, dozens to sometimes hundreds of venues around the world who who write to us and say, you know, we'd like to show the film two nights, whatever, and we charge them a you know a certain screening fee as a minimum guarantee, mm-hmm. um, and that works out pretty well. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's quite an operation. It's really um, it's all scaled, right? To to. To, to size here, right? I mean, it's... Yeah, thank God for the digital universe because uh, yeah. it was not something you could do you know, when films were these three heavy metal cans that you had to ship all over creation. And, sure uh, then. Yeah, but now you, know, you put the whole movie on a, a hard drive and sometimes even a Blu-ray, we do that often. Uh, somebody, you know, in Austin wants mm-hmm. to show this show the thing and they'll uh, show a movie and they'll just ask for the Blu-ray and we just mail that to them for $2 and they mail it back <laughs> when they're done. Yeah. It's pretty remarkable, right? Yeah. You, if you think about it very much. And then also, just to take a baby step back from that, I should have mentioned first is uh, are you going to, to uh, go to festivals? I mean, you're definitely be invited, I'm sure, to a couple of these international festivals which are very supportive of you. Um but you have made a, a film with a, um, right. you know, a bunch of very, um, you know, reliable, well beloved uh, actors, including you know Bill and and Parker and mm-hmm. Edie, et cetera. And I'm wondering if you're, and also I, I was going to wonder if you're going to try to get out to a bunch of festivals here in the states. Well, I don't know how many uh, mm-hmm. I'll be going to, but yeah, I hope that the film will premiere somewhere. Um, so, you know, I'll see when the film's done. I'm imagining it'll be done in the autumn. Uh, but since I'm financing it and I'm in charge, I mean, I don't right. really have to rush myself. I could take as long as I want to finish the film. Um, I wouldn't mind having a film of mine have its world premiere right here in New York, you know, at the New York Film Festival. That would be nice. I can well, get I'm on the subway and go down there. You know, I'm, well, I'm on the screening committee. So Are I'm you? Not- well, a pre-screening committee. It's not a <laughs> not a programmer, but I am watching the film. Yeah, but the I, you know, so it's it really doesn't make. I I wouldn't have much. Uh, right. I feel like I may have been instrumental with one documentary a friend of mine made, and I sent it to, you know, uh, Dennis Lim, 
and and then it got in now but i never got a confirmation saying adam thank you for sending that to my attention and uh, uh-huh. we're going to put we're going to include it but i'd like to think that's th- my <laughs> my handiwork you know yeah. um but no uh i i'm pretty sure you could handle it yeah i think that that's not an unreasonable uh goal yeah we'll see i mean a couple of my films flirt and amateur were uh programmed mm-hmm. at new york um but that was quite a while ago so we'll see I think it would be nice, though, to do, you know, a, a, a premiere aside, uh, Hal, that, that you go to a bunch. Uh, again, I know financially it, it, it just depends on who's going to pay for your way, but um, that you go to a bunch of festivals like Traverse City. I, I've been very lucky in the last few years. I've gone to a number of festivals where they're not I'm not suggesting the marketplace festivals because I don't think it's it makes any sense in in terms of what we've been talking about but when you're yeah i mean if the you business wanted, is different yeah. yeah but with a this, this sort of almost alternate method of distributing your film you know you go to these festivals where they're really heavy duty community supported festivals where everybody even the hamptons i it's kind of ritzy and everybody's loaded right. uh i mean financially but they do really love going to the movies and they show up and they buy the tickets and they and they love meeting the filmmakers and they talk to them and they they talk it to their friends and there's press you know local press and i think you know from that one all the way to like i said traverse city there i went to that last summer and and man you i i just saw so many excited people who were volunteering at the festival and going to see everything buying all the tickets there are certain festivals and you know i'd be happy to talk to you at another date about it but i think you would have an incredible time and people would love to meet you and and see the film and you you know it's just another like ripple of distribution in a way you know, because there's so many festivals now. Yeah, no, that that's a thing that we try to cultivate here. You know, we have a because you know we get emails from every festival, right? Every yeah. You know, so, and yeah, we try to stay in touch with those people, and we put them on our news. And then letters. they write, and of course they go into the next Kickstarter. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's no, it's but great. that no, you're absolutely right. That's the kind of thing you have to cultivate, and. Um, because you know, there's you might have a new audience there. All these uh, little, very little festivals that are community supported, and um, yeah, your film might not ever get to that particular city in Michigan, otherwise. Right. You know? But yeah. uh, that little festival Precisely. will do it. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Well, I, I hope around the time that the feature is getting is ready to go out into the world that we'll do this one more time and um you know uh look forward to seeing it and um oh good yeah i look forward to getting it made and showing everybody (laughs) okay great well thanks again for taking all that time again and and, no problem uh, it really means a lot and i'm so glad we'll be able i'll be able to get this up and out before the retrospective begins on on friday um yeah Okay, so, then. Many thanks. All right, so take care and have take a care, good... Take care, Adam. Uh, Thank you for so much. Always. Okay. Right.